If you guys want to stand up, we're going to get started today. the world but it couldn't feel me man's empty praise and treasures the fame I never enough and you came along and put me back together my every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. And nothing is better than you. And I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, failures and flaws. Lord, you've seen them all, and you still call me friend. Because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. And nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. And nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing 
I'm better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. song we could ever sing worthy of all the praise we could ever bring worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you Jesus the name above every other name Jesus, the only one that could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Only there is no one like you, there is no one beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one that could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Only there is no one like you, there is no one beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And only there is no one like you, there is no one besides you. Open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. And I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken and only there is no one like you there is no one beside you Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. 
and I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone, and I will not be shaken, and only there is no one like you, there is no one beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me only there is no one like you there is no one beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me.
expenses if you like stories that deal with the death of one of the kind of popular ones in the football world was just made into a movie last year called American Underdog. It's about Kurt Warner. Now, I haven't seen the movie yet. He plays for the Leafs in fall season, primarily with the Rams, and then in St. Louis, and later with the Cardinals. And his career is regarded as one of the greatest things that ever played in football history, maybe even sports history. He went to an undrafted free agent. He spent three or four years in the Arena Football League to winning his winning a Super Bowl for St. Louis for the first time as his first year as a starter. Quite the trip, quite the redemptive arc. He was a backup who was thrown into uh, the starter role in his first year in St. Louis, and they won the Super Bowl, and he became the Super Bowl MVP, and after a long career, they made an inductee to the Football Hall of Fame. Just a cool story, magical story. He badly broke through just to get by, and then a couple years later, when he was on the biggest platform, the biggest show, and he's performing at the highest level, he wins the Super Bowl as the Super Bowl MVP. It's the story that we get goosebumps thinking about. It's the story we love to watch and see Hollywood tell stories about the man who kind of got to live into those moments. So why am I opening this morning talking about Kurt Warner? Not just because he's a Christian, so we talk about him in our church. It's because his story is a redemptive story. That draws us in and loves to root for the underdog, the person who didn't make the cut, who failed, but they came back and proved everyone wrong. Maybe some of you are hoping to live that kind of story, that kind of redemptive story into your life. And I think we're drawn to these stories because our hearts long for redemption to be true. That there is some sort of process where we can be broken, we can we can be defeated, yet there is some way in which we can find renewal. We can find healing. We can find some sort of new way to get back on track. So we're in week three of our series on identity. And we're going to be talking about the redemption that comes from the biblical story. What's the pathway of redemption that we find in Scripture? And does our culture actually give us any pathways for redemption? So in the first week, there's an important framework. If you weren't with us for the first week, I want to highlight a few things that we went through. What first, what does our identity mean? What does it mean when we talk about identity? Simply put, your identity is what makes you you. It's your understanding of the personal self. So Tim Keller gives three questions that, if we can answer these questions, they point us to our identity. Here's what they are. What do I live for? The first question. You all need to live for something. What gets you out of bed? What motivates you to go through life, to navigate life? And then second, what am I worth? What am I worth? What's my value? And third, who gets a say? Who gets a say? Is it my family? Is it my community? Is it my culture? Is it my faith? What is it? Who gets to say what I'm worth? In our traditional identity, it's kind of two frameworks for identity. Traditional identity, which is how most of the Western world found their identity until somewhat recently, was an outside-in approach to identity. You figured out what you were worth. You figured out uh, uh, what you uh, ought to live for by an outside source of truth. So it could have been from religion, telling you what you ought to live for. It could be your family, saying, you're going to be a doctor, I don't care what you say. Your family of doctors, you will be a doctor. It could be from your community or your culture, saying, this is the highest good. This is virtuous. Eternal life to, to, to fit in, to be congruent with that external reality or that external truth. That's a traditional identity. Who gets a say? Generally your family or your community. They'll let you know if you're doing well or not. Right? 
Some of you know that very well. Maybe they're well-meaning and maybe they're loving, but they will let you know if you're reaching your goals or the standards that they've set for you. And that's how you generally figure out what you're worth. What's my highest good? Am I achieving that highest good? Am I achieving that truth? And when we are, feel pretty good about ourselves. When we're not, we're crushed. And we feel like we have no self-worth. Maybe some of you feel that way right now. The modern identity is kind of a, a pushback against the traditional identity. It's the opposite. It's an inside-out approach. You find the truth. You find your highest good. You find what you ought to value and what you ought to pursue from yourself inward. Your desires, your greatest dreams, those are what kind of give you the bedrock of which you should pursue and so it's an inside-out identity where you tell the world who you are, what you value, what you're about, and what you're pursuing, and it is the world's responsibility to accommodate that identity. It's an inside-out uh, type of identity. And who gets a say? Now, in this perspective, no one but you, because you are the source of truth, you are the source of what's right, you are the source of what you are to pursue, and so no one gets to tell you um, what you ought to live for or what you're worth beside yourself. Now those are the kind of the two uh, identities that we uh, find ourselves, those are kind of what the culture gives us as a pathway of figuring out who you are. I would say the modern identity is the primary pathway that is told to us, whether it's through stories, through books, through movies, through advertising, you are the captain of your ship. You get to decide and everyone else should accommodate that. In both of these identities, your worth is primarily determined by whether you're living up to the first question, what do I live for? They're primarily based on performance. Are you performing? Are you achieving? If you are, you're worth something. If you're not, you ain't worth much. And some of you probably feel that way, maybe even right now. Maybe it wasn't a good week when it comes to living up to the standards that either you personally set for yourself or maybe your family set for you or society set for you or your faith set for you. And you didn't live up to that and you're feeling very defeated. So the question is, when it comes to how we find our identity and what our culture tells us, what is the cultural pathway for redemption? What's the story? If you don't perform, if you don't achieve, if you betray someone, if you make a huge mistake, if you hurt the people that you love, if you never live up to your highest goals and aspirations, what's the story of redemption? Because in Kurt Warner's uh, story, it's he was bagging groceries, he failed, he got cut, he didn't make the squad, he's bagging groceries, and then what happens? He performs and he achieves. That's the redemptive story. But what about the 99% of people that are just bagging groceries and they don't make it to the Super Bowl. Kurt Warner's standard is, or story is not the norm. It's not the norm at all. What is the cultural pathway for redemption? Generally, it's just figure it out, try harder, grit. If you live for football, try your hardest and you don't make it, what does that do to your worth? It crushes it. Then you gotta figure something else out. Okay, it's not football. Some of you figured that out real early, <laughs> right? But then what is it? What do I live for? It didn't work in this area. I better go find something else that I can achieve, that I can perform, that I can actually feel comfortable in my own skin. So the question I want to explore this morning is when we fail, when we don't reach our goals, when we miss the mark, when we disappoint or even betray the trust of those we love, what is our redemption story? How do we pursue it? How do we find it? What do we say to ourselves when we fail and sometimes fail miserably? What's the story? I would say that our culture doesn't have one. It's usually try harder or figure something else out for you to perform and for you to achieve. That's the only answer. Try harder, figure it out. Both pathways are pathways of self-righteousness. 
that we can make ourselves right in the eyes of ourselves and in the eyes of others. We are the ones to make it right by our actions. Now to our ears, that sounds right. That sounds pretty good. Take ownership of your junk and make it right. Try harder. But I'm gonna argue this morning that self-righteousness is not the answer. It does not lead to redemption. Instead, it leads to arrogance or shameful hiding, both in hopes of preserving your worth. But Jesus offers a radically different pathway of redemption, one that's scandalous, one that's kind of a stumbling block for us. And that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. We're gonna be in Romans chapter three. Romans chapter three, we're gonna start in verse 19. So open up your paper Bibles if you've got one of those. Open up your smartphones if you don't have one of those. And if you got nothing, just follow along. And I promise I'm not making this up <laughs> straight from the Bible. Romans chapter three, starting in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world will be, may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So just to pause there, what Paul is talking about is the law. It's, it's God's uh, word, it's God's standards given to the people of Israel. He says, this is how you ought to live, this is how you ought not to live. And he's saying, by following the law, by trying to religiously perform, by following the law perfectly, nobody can be justified by that because we're imperfect. We're broken. We're sinful people. Now that's the, ba that's the bad news. We'll get to the good news. But he's saying, none of us will be justified, none of us will find our worth by achieving, by performing, in this way, performing through the law. That's what Paul is saying, which would have been quite the scandalous, radical thing to say, especially maybe to a Jewish audience, even a pagan audience. I would say even to us. Verse 21, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forth as a propitiation, that's a word you can use in conversation, by his blood to be received by faith. This was, shown, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. So what's going on here? If you don't have a background in scripture, if you haven't read this passage, you might be like, what kind of stuff is going on here? There's a lot of different words, and we want to unpack, primarily we want to unpack two words that we don't really use in our everyday conversation, righteousness and justification. But Paul's main argument is that your performance, your achievement isn't going to cut it. That's not how you find your worth. And, and in fact, what it does is it exposes your brokenness. That when there's a standard that you cannot achieve, all it does is remind you of your sin and brokenness, that you don't make the cut. And so we either lower our standard, find a new standard, or we hide and we lie. And we say we're living up to that standard even though we're not. So it produces arrogance or shame. Now I want to focus on two words from the passage, righteousness and justification. Both of these words sound a little stuffy to us. We don't use them all that much. So let me try to explain them. Righteousness, here's what it means. And this is Tim Keller's uh, definition. I'm like, what's the word I'm looking for? 
Righteousness is a validating performance record. Righteousness is a validating performance record. Think of a resume or a report card, an admissions letter to culture or to college. Every culture, every religion has a sense of righteousness. This is what you have to do to be worthy of acceptance by your community, by yourself internally, or by your God. You have to build a resume, so to speak, about your achievement, and you have to give that to others, give that to God, and say, see, look at my accomplishments, look at what I've done, look at how good I've been, look at what a good boy or a good girl I've been, and please accept me based on what I've shown you, what I have achieved. And that's what we do, that's how our culture functions. And you see it when you want a job, you see it when you want to get into something, you want to be validated by your performance record. That is what righteousness means. And what Paul is saying is that we do not find righteousness in our own performance by following the law. And justification is tied with righteousness but it's basically your answer to why you're here. And we're always trying to figure that out. And it might shift in different seasons. Why am I here? How do I justify my existence? That I'm taking up space and resources. Now in America, we can distract ourselves out of that question for a really long time. We've got Netflix, podcasts, Spotify. We don't have to think about that stuff if we don't want to. We can stay busy. But those are the kind of questions that we wrestle with. Every single human being, every single culture wrestles with the questions of righteousness and justification. What am I worth? Why am I here? Everyone wants to justify their existence. Now you might be thinking, sweet, I'm not religious. I, just, I was dragged here. I don't have to buy into any of this stuff. I don't have to think about righteousness or justification. And I would say, it's not true. I believe every person is pursuing righteousness in some shape or form, whether it's trying to create a resume for your family, your tribe, your culture, or your religion. It could be a validating uh, performance record for your own standard, your own self-expression. Am I being authentic to my true self? Am I listening to my heart? What that is called is self-righteousness. Pursuing righteousness on your own. Pursuing a validating performance record on your own. And I will say, you'll see it in scripture, and you've probably seen it in your own life, or you've seen it in other people's life, it is incredibly destructive. Self-righteousness. And it is an incredibly unsatisfying pathway towards redemption. Self-righteousness is incredibly unsatisfying and incredibly destructive as a pathway for redemption. Paul is telling us right up front, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Now, if you're religious, your validating performance record is built, your resume is built by your ability to keep the law, God's commands. Your worth to yourself, your church community, and to God is tied to your religious performances. Your ability to do what you ought to and don't do what you ought not to do. Many of you probably grew up in a faith system like that. And maybe it led to crushing and crippling shame and despair. Now the problem with this is that nobody is perfect and we have to deal with that reality of our own brokenness and sin. So we either turn towards arrogance, shame, or a mixture of both. Because we're not perfect, we need to protect our image, so we boast in our strengths and we minimize or ignore our weaknesses. We deflect or ignore criticism and we love to compare ourselves to others, especially others who don't have as good of a performance record as we do. And that's how we find validation. This helps us create the illusion that we are righteous. 
Or we hide our flaws, our sin, our weakness. We wear masks, we withdraw, we isolate for fear that we will be found out. If they really knew who I was, they wouldn't find me worth anything and they wouldn't love me. And these tendencies aren't just for the religious, it's for anyone who is building a record through their own performance. That doesn't sound very good, right? It doesn't sound like necessarily good news. That's the tension. So what's the answer? What's the biblical answer? What's the Bible's Kurt Warner story, so to speak? So here's the biblical storyline to catch us up to speed. First, you can kind of think of it in in a four-act play. First, we have creation. We talked about this last week. God creates humanity in his image. Both male and female are created to represent God in the world, and they were given inherent value and the responsibility to steward God's good creation. They had good relationship with each other, and they had good relationship with God. They were walking around naked for crying out loud. There was no shame, there was no hiding at that point. The only rule they were given was to trust God and steward the earth based on his definition of good. However, humanity chooses to trust themselves and rule over God's good uh, creation by defining good and evil on their own terms. And this leads to a spiral of pain and destruction as humans define good and evil based solely on what benefits them, no matter if it hurts others. We see that throughout the biblical story and we see this throughout human history. That when we take it on ourselves to be the ultimate king, the ultimate ruler, the ultimate authority, God, and we define what's good and evil, often what that means for us is whatever benefits me the most. So there's a fall Sin enters the world, there's the human condition. And then God offers humanity grace by reestablishing a relationship with humanity, starting with a single person, Abraham, which soon becomes the nation of Israel, and God would reestablish that relationship where Israel would be his people and they would live by his authority. So throughout the Old Testament, you have God defining good and evil for Israel. It's called the law, that's what Paul is referring to. And what we see over and over again is Israel is failing to live up by that standard over and over and over again. In the New Testament, Jesus distills the entirety of the law down to loving God and loving others. And therefore, sin is the failure to love God and love others, which I think we're all in that boat. That's what Paul is talking about there. We've all fallen short because that's the standard. Love God with all that you have and love your neighbor as yourself. Do we live up to that every day? The answer is obviously no. So the biblical answer for redemption is found in Jesus, in the cross. That God came down in the flesh that Jesus walked among us, suffered among us, suffered for us on the cross to take on our sins, the consequences of our sins, our failure, our shame. He took it all on his shoulders on the cross so that we could be forgiven, we could be redeemed, and we could be justified. So Paul wrote the letter to the Romans that we just read from And he makes these three arguments. Everyone's fallen short of God's standard. We're not able to find redemption in our performance, but all can find redemption that is freely given in Jesus. That is what the Bible calls the gospel, which means good news. So what does this mean? Most of us think of forgiveness, which is true and so important, But here's what it kind of means. It's beyond just forgiveness. Forgiveness is part of it, but it's so much more than that when it comes to justification. So to be forgiven or to be pardoned says this, go, you're free from punishment. That's how most of us probably came to Jesus as little kids. They gave us an option. You've got heaven, you've got hell, make your pick. Six-year-old self's like, hell sounds really bad. I'm gonna avoid that. It's the idea of pardon, forgiveness, You get to avoid the consequences of all your failure and all of your brokenness and all of your shame. 
But what this is saying is that we are freely justified. Now, what does that mean? Pardon says, go, you're free from punishment. Justified says, come and experience the depths of my love and grace in relationship. That's the difference between mercy and grace. Mercy means we don't get what we deserve, and grace means we get more than we deserve. And this is talking about the grace of God that not our, we're not just pardoned criminals who are let free from, from our failure and our brokenness and our sin, but we are adopted into the family of God as sons and daughters of God welcomed into his family, not just for now where we can experience the life-giving relationship of Jesus, where we can experience the Holy Spirit in our life, but we get to have that for eternity. It goes beyond just forgiveness. It goes beyond just the pardoning of our sin or our debt. We're justified. We're given a new status. We're welcomed in. We get to experience the benefits of knowing God, of being redeemed and restored by God. The gospel says that our sins are forgiven. Jesus has absorbed the cost and punishment of our sin, but it also says that you're welcomed into God's family as sons and daughters adopted and given the status of his kids. And when we understand that our justification is freely given as a gift of grace, that we don't have to perform for it, that Jesus' righteousness, his resume is handed to us, so that when we approach the throne of God, it's Jesus' resume given to him on our behalf. It frees us from the bondage of self-righteousness. The pride, the fear, the control, the shame, the anxiety of being found out. It allows us to deal with our brokenness and sin because it's not our performance and perfection that make us righteous. So we can own it. It doesn't mean it's easy to admit your flaws, to ask for forgiveness, to repent, to change. But it means that your identity is not built on your performance or your perfection. And that frees you up to ask for forgiveness, to forgive others, to love. We don't achieve our redemption, we receive it. That's the good news of the gospel. What is the good news of our culture? What's the pathway of redemption that our culture gives us? I'm not sure there is one. Or at least anything kind of understandable or coherent or cohesive. What happens if you don't live up to your standard, to your truth? What happens if it doesn't work, if you don't make the Super Bowl? What happens if the problem is you? Where do you go from there? What do you do? The Christian identity gives us the only identity where our righteousness isn't found in ourselves, and this frees us. It frees us. And final thing, it frees us and allows us to forgive and cultivate a culture of forgiveness. When our righteousness isn't found in ourselves, we are also able to forgive others. It cultivates a culture of redemption rather than self-righteousness. And boy, do we need that right now. We live in a very unforgiving culture, which is ironic. The late Catholic bishop George Francis from Chicago put it like this, we live in a society that permits everything and forgives nothing. That sounds like a terrible society to live in, right? A society that permits everything, anything goes, but then there's also these undefined rules and if you cross this boundary and if you say this thing, there is no forgiveness, there is no pathway to redemption. What a terrible society to live in. If we are functioning through self-righteousness, then of course forgiveness will be lacking. 
But if we understand the depths of our own brokenness and sin and have experienced the forgiveness through the cross, then we have the spiritual resources to empathize and forgive those who have failed, even wrong us. Because we've experienced that through Jesus. Not through our own self-righteousness, not through our own performance or striving, but through the grace of God have we received that kind of forgiveness. Therefore, we can offer it to others. And we can cultivate an environment where the church is a culture which forgives each other, which offers grace, which empathizes with each other, which walks with each other through their brokenness and their sin, who wants to see healing, not condemnation. And that can bleed out into the rest of the culture and the culture can begin to say, okay, what is missing? We don't want to be this self-righteous culture anymore. We don't have a clear pathway of redemption in our culture. It seems our only answer is various forms of self-righteousness. Only the gospel offers a truly unique pathway toward redemption and restoration that is not achieved, it is received. And that truly sets us free. Let's pray. Father God, teach us this deep in our hearts. Make this become the foundational piece of our identity, the bedrock that we would put our roots deep into and understand that it is by your grace, by your love for us, lavishly shown on the cross that we are made new, we are redeemed, we are restored, and we can be justified. Father God, there are many of us who've grown up in the church and we have never gotten this. We have lived by self-righteousness and religious moralism where we're trying to earn our worth and your affection through our performance. God, break us of that self-righteousness. Help us to understand the depths of our sin and our brokenness, not because it leads us to shame, but it leads us to the cross where we can be redeemed by you, Lord. So God, we are thankful for all that you've done all that you've secured for us. And all these things in your name, amen. We're now gonna enter into a time of communion and worship. We've got two communion tables that are surrounded by chairs, so we're gonna have to get a little creative here, folks. Um, I would probably suggest going around the outside and going to the communion table, Um, but we're gonna take communion as a church. We do it every uh, first Sunday of the month, and that is our outdoor service. So this is what I'm gonna encourage you to do and pray through. What is communion? Communion is a corporate reminder of what we just talked about. The gospel, what Jesus has done for us. The sacrifice that he made so that we could be redeemed and reconciled back to him. Now here's a question I want you to ask while you're thinking through communion. Where am I striving for my worth? Where in my life am I striving for my worth? Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you. And when you identify that, give that over to the Lord. Recognize that that's a counterfeit source of redemption. And when you give that over to the Lord, trust in Him, in His redemptive work on the cross, His forgiveness, His grace. So we're gonna get up in a minute and you, you go and you take of the elements. If you haven't been here with us, you'll take of the cup and you'll take of the bread and you can bring it back to your chair and then you can have communion on your own or with your friends or with your family and I want you to ponder those things. If you don't have a relationship with Jesus, uh, we invite you to hold off on communion, but we would love for you to have a relationship with Jesus and to put your trust in him. And so if you're curious about that, please come talk to me after service, and I would love to talk to you about what it looks like and how to have that relationship with Jesus. It's simple but profound. So right now, I'm inviting you to, to go and grab the elements and bring them back to your seat and spend some time in reflection and worship.
Here in a second, I'm gonna start singing. Um, take your time. When you're ready, you can stand up and start singing with us, but um, take your time and finish out. Finish out your time with God. Finish out your communion. Um, feel no rush to join until you're ready.
over the ashes A wide open zoom where there should be a casket Children knocking in and dancing and laughing The Father is welcome, this is our welcome The roses in bloom, forced up from the embers A rivers of tears flow from good times and bad Families are singing and dancing and laughing Wow. 
please pray with me. Father God, um, you are great and you are worthy of our praise. And so we lift that up to you as a body unified by Christ and the grace that we've experienced in his sacrifice, in the love that he's shown us. So God, transform our hearts to be a mercy-shaped, a grace-shaped people who don't function out of self-righteousness, but firmly root our worth and our value in what you've done what you've secured for us. All these things in your name. Amen. You all can have a seat. Uh, we've got a couple announcements, and then we also have a special guest um, that we want to, to share with us for a few moments. Um, we're, we're a little short on time, so I'm not going to go through every single announcement, but um, grab one of these and take a look. All the details are on here. Um, we've got a trip to Israel coming up in 2023, and if you're interested in that, we're going to have an informational meeting August 14th. Uh, Women's Fellowship coming up. Uh, community Bible Study is at the Lutheran Concordia Church. That starts August 25th. I would really encourage you to participate in that if you can. There's women's studies and men's studies. We also have a membership orientation coming up in September, September 18th and a baptism service October 2nd. So if you haven't been baptized and you would love to explore what that uh, is and what that looks like and being a part of that service, uh, we would love to have a conversation with you. That is planned for October 2nd. So I'm gonna invite up uh, Rachel, and she is with Sela, and so she's gonna share. Uh, if you didn't know, we have several partner ministries that we partner with. You can come around here so you don't have to jump up. Um, we, we partner with several different ministries uh, in the Valley, and um, Sela is one of them. So she is gonna share uh, what Sela does. And then after she's done sharing, we're gonna pray over her as a church and pray over Sela. And so um, uh, we're excited about that. So Rachel, why don't you please share with us? Thank you guys for sharing this morning with me. Um, I think most of you are very familiar with Sela. You have been a very proactive church um, and have had a lot of history. Angie Worley was once director. Sarah Bartles, who was also part of your church or is, um, so it is an honor to be here to get to share my face with you guys and to see all of your faces um, because we truly cannot do this ministry without each and every one of you with your prayers and support. So I'm really excited to come and talk about what's going on. We do have um, lots of things happening, um, but first I want to say that message was spot on and I've led women's groups on that, the topic of identity, and just, it's really fascinating to see how people put their worth, um, like a report card, um, evaluating their life, and so I would always direct them back to know the Lord is what keeps us, um, he's that heartbeat in our lives, and, and our actions are a reflection of him, and, um, you know, I just don't understand how people can do life without knowing their identity and being in him, so, um, especially with this job, I've had moments of I don't need to put up with this. I don't need to do this job. I'm just telling you that spiritual heaviness has been so heavy. Um, but God has redeemed that, and I've had a couple of months of just rejuvenation. And um, Pastor David actually came and um, met with my husband and I. In those really dark moments, I will tell you, it meant a lot. And I'm out of that. So, um, yes. So I do want to thank you so much for the support you've given to Sila in the past. Um, the Lord is using you to help us c meet with community members um, and help meet needs in the community, um, working alongside and ministering to women and families. So my family, uh, we came here a little over five years ago. We have three children, seven, eight, and ten, um, and we live in Hayden, but we have loved living here. We love the people in the valley um, all across and so to get to be back in, in the work field, um, that is new to me since having kids. So I'm, uh, I've struggled a little bit with relinquishing some of those previous things I've gotten to do. But it is an amazing opportunity to serve in this way and to be a part of what Sela is doing. So our mission is to provide tangible hope in a compassionate environment through the love of Jesus, making abortion unnecessary. So at Sela, we offer free pregnancy tests. Uh, confidential and safe support. Sometimes women just need a safe place to come. Um, their living situation, they might be renting out a bedroom, they might have just had a baby and they're just trying to do life in this little box. 
Um, it's just very difficult. Accurate information on all options. I think we all know what we're facing with the, the media and what they are putting out right now. Post-abortion healing support. There's an incredible need for post-abortion healing support, even in our churches, and I will talk more about that. Healthy relationship coaching. Um, we are seeing even more men coming in, and they want to know how to co-parent. Um, and of course, we try to talk with them about, uh, you know, marriage is the best way that God has intended it to be. But, um, you know, we just walk through them. We meet them where they're at, and we walk through life with them the most that we can. So our goals for the next two years um, are ultrasounds, STI testing, and treatment. Um, and I'm happy to say we are literally at the cusp of bringing a new ultrasound machine to SELA. Um, we have just hired a nurse practitioner. And um, I know it's just like, it gives me chills to just tell you this is the first time I've gotten to announce it. And we also have an RDMS who's going to do our ultrasound. So she will be on site performing those um, one day a week. And we'll go to one and a half days a week. And we'll evaluate our need as we go on. So, um, and then I have potentially in my mind doing telehealth capabilities and maybe even a mobile unit to help service Walden, um, Hayden, Craig, and like there's Maybell, which is a very tiny town, but there still is a need and we still want to make sure that we, we have communities knowing that we see them. They're all valuable, so we want to go to them. So who we see is a variety of clients. Um, some are unchurched or unaffiliated with church. Most of them claim to be Christian or some kind of faith-based, but um, they do lack resources, like a secure living situation, financial stability, and social support. And I think um, what's hard is a lot of these people think that they are a Christian, and um, you know, there's just not a lot of fruit there. So you know, we really just try to meet with them and help walk them through what that really looks like um, and minister to them. So to a woman, it's all a, they're all big deals if you don't have that financial support. Um, the fi uh, living situation is difficult and the social support, thinking your friends are thinking, like, how are you going to carry this baby? How are you going to provide for this baby? So we just really try to help support in the ways that we can to help them carry and have a successful um, delivery. 64% of abortions happen because the father doesn't want the baby or the mother is coerced by others. We have um, many stories of um, different situations that support this statistic. Abortion pills are easily obtained, and they are um, they are they process and the process and the potential side effects are traumatizing. When women order these into their homes and they take them, there's um, things that they go through in in their homes that are very deafening. It's silencing and it's guilt. It gives them guilt, so they just don't know how to process that. Um, and so most struggle with that. So we just want to make sure that they know that we are there for the after. Um, you know, we just had a client. It was really a difficult situation, very twisted. Um, but she came in, I need an abortion. I can't, that's the only option out. And so we talked with her. We asked her questions just to help her process. And she was in a really bad um, situation and felt like it was her only way out. And she did end up carrying through with it. Um, so our board, we had a carnation given to each um, each board member at that meeting because, you know, who's grieving the loss of that child? You know, every child is worth grieving. So um, she knows that she can come to us for the post-abortion care, and she did say that she wants to. She's just not gotten back in touch with us yet. You know, they have a process that they have to go through in their emotional state to be able to do that. But we exist for those people. So, um, you know, ordinary people together can do extraordinary things. And so that is where you guys come in. And um, we just who know the Lord and we have a message of hope to give to these people. So thank you to pro-life organizations um, like Focus on the Family, and Now Abortion, Pregnancy Centers, Churches, um, and like Knights of Columbus. They're the ones that are gonna, going to be funding um, most of the machine or all of the machine. We're still working on that detail. Um, they are they are helping um, our community to grow and see the true struggles that abortion brings to our society. So it's important to train and equip you guys. I have a burden to do that. So whether it be um, having a mentorship team that if I have a client that comes who would be ideal to to connect with, um, you know, I would love to then 
once we've worked with them to feed them into churches so they have ongoing support. Um, so it's not like they come, with t come to us and then they just leave and don't have any support after they've had that baby and after the first year. We typically walk through the first year with them and then they, they are off. So while Sila has a direct and intentional mis mission, um, I do want to collaborate more and make sure that I'm providing the information that I can to you. Um, it's really difficult for some people to know how to talk with people who are considering an abortion or maybe have had one. They're afraid to offend. You know, what kind of lingo? What, like, how do I talk to them? What questions can I ask? Um, and uncertain just of, of how to navigate those conversations. So that's just really simple stuff that we can make a class and just kind of walk you through what would be ways that we could do that. Um, I do have some stats from CareNet. CareNet is an organization that we're affiliated with. Um, there's other large ones like Heartbeat International, but we belong to CareNet, um, and they all just help provide support to us. So um, they have stats for us from what we've given to them, and then they collect from across the states and then give it back to us so that we can report to you. So we have two out of five women in churches who are currently seeking abortion or are post-abortive. 43% attend church monthly or more at the time of an abortion. Nearly 64% of women believe church members are more likely to gossip about a woman considering an abortion than to help her understand her options. We know that's not true, but that's how they feel. Only 38% of women who have had an abortion consider church a safe place to discuss pregnancy options, including parenting, abortion, and adoption. 96% of churches do not talk about abortion from the pulpit as they are not sure how to address it and to provide tangible support. So our God continues to breathe into this ministry and to revive and encourage us. Um, and he's bringing revival to this movement. I mean, you look at the overturn of Roe versus Wade, that doesn't change anything about our mission. We're still here to help people in our community. So. Um, we have a SELA volunteer who is just very dear to us. Um, she has her own abortion story and is very open about that, but she has written something and has okayed for me to share, <coughs> share what she wrote. So she has said, when I read chapter 37 in Ezekiel that talks of dry bones coming alive, I think of the agony of the buried pain of those who have had an abortion and are hanging on to hope by a thread, how they feel deadened and weary to their very bones, the hurt so deeply wounding them that they are dry bones walking, that they are living but not alive in the core of their being. Through the power of Christ and his Holy Spirit, we need to find and talk to those who are tormented and in pain, who feel dry as a desert and a part of their hearts, to call them to rise up and be healed, to speak the truth of abortion and of their abortions. And that is happening. It's so exciting to see women stepping into the centers and even men at times they I mean men have their own stories too and they are actively sharing and wanting to volunteer and help other people so for them to once again have the broken and fragmented pieces of their lives brought together by their creator and life once again breathed into their beings life spoken by God into them that they rise up as an army to testify of his love and of the holiness of life and once again stand forgiven, those slain by sin and redeemed by the Holy Spirit to become an exceedingly great army, standing in the love, in love in the gap for him. She has a beautiful way with words. I love, um, we have her in every week, and she just always has an encouragement um, from the word for us, and it's just special to share that with her. So what the church can do, I'm going to wrap it up because I know we're getting long, <laughs> um, but there is a lot of work that needs to be done to equip you. So if there are things that immediately come to mind, meet with me after the service or get in touch with me later. I certainly want to hear ideas, um, you know, other ways that we may be able to connect in the community to help support these, these people. Um, we need men and women mentors who can help our local churches to help stand in the gap to work with people who may have a guilt, um, have guilt with an abortion in their past. So I'm looking to develop a mentor team, um, specifically a men's team, just to have uh, available. I do have women volunteers. I don't have men volunteers um, that could be a little bit more trained in the conversation of abortion and how if a man does come alongside or even just on fatherhood, um, you know, just helping him know the proper steps according to the word of God, how to do life. 
Um, we are also looking at a program that can be implemented in churches, but I, I'm just feeling like more on a personal level is just what we need, um, just one-on-one, one-on-two. So what we can do now is to just educate yourself. You can read a book on mentoring someone or on the topic of abortion, whatever your interests lie. Um, You get on trusted websites. You can contact us to ask for direction and what resources might be good. You can engage in pro-life activism if you're politically minded or respond to any articles that you might see in the paper. You can actively talk about SELA and organizations in our community that promote life. We have a lot of great organizations in, in Steamboat. Know what is going on in your public schools. Guys, this is a really, really big one. <laughs> so the um, Code of Regulations by the Colorado State Board of Education, I have this printed out if anyone would want to see, but what it states is that nurses, can put, they can give out birth control. They're actually required um, to, as the need would come up, they're required to support the child. Um, they can perform pelvic exams and do uh, the sexual gender health discussions, um, depression health, and not report it to the parents. Um, Counselors can give depression and suicide ideology and have gender identity counseling without reporting it to parents. At age 17, which would be a senior, um, a school counselor can potentially take your child for an abortion without your permission. So that is what we're dealing with um, within our schools. And even in Hayden, I have some research to do with our nurse and just talking with her. Our kids go to Hayden School, and I'm just very curious on how she would answer to what the state (laughs) regulations are, um, just to know the level of what we're dealing with and the transparency of that all. And I would love for you guys to do the same, and please let me know what your conversations are, because that helps me as I go to churches and talk. I want to make sure that I'm accurately reporting that as well. So um, the last couple things would be supporting moms in need. You can tell them about SELA. We're always happy to help a family if we can help them. Um, But also forming your own post-abortion healing support group in your church. Again, I would be happy to help equip you with that or suggest studies that might be good. Um, And then you can come to or or volunteer at SELA. Um, You know, we always love to have faces, and we actually are about to have, um, it will be around Christmas time most likely, but we had a private donor give money for a full renovation. It just moves me. It's literally everything is getting a facelift, and the Lord is doing a lot of work with us right now. So thank you for having me. (laughs) I do have some things if you guys want, uh, like little decals and stuff, but I'll be over here for questions and I can hand some stuff out then. Okay. Thank you. So, we're going we're gonna to pray for Sila, we're going to pray for uh, Rachel, and so if you want, you can put your hand out if you want to uh, pray with me, and, uh, and then we'll have some food. Father God, um, we pray uh, for Sila. Um, We pray for clarity as they embark on some new endeavors, as they um, make some breakthroughs with some of the medical uh, services that they can offer, ultrasound, having a nurse practitioner. God, those are amazing, amazing steps forward for Sila. And so, God, we praise you for that. We thank you for your generosity and your support for this ministry. God, we ask for clarity as they navigate some difficult issues, difficult topics, difficult conversations, one that is uh, just very, very um, polarized and uh, very uh, uh, highly emotional. And so, God, we just pray for clarity and wisdom as you help them speak a loving truth into people's lives who are in crisis. God, we pray for the local churches that they would support Sila And God, not just support... Uh, Sila, but but support life, support the women who are in moments of crisis and in need, support the families, the husbands who are in moments of maybe panic and anxiety as um, they're they're hit with something unexpected in their life, but that we would be able to come alongside and love well and be generous with our time and be generous with our resources. God, we pray for strength and protection for Rachel and her family. Um, that you would just give her, again, uh, an identity rooted in you, and as she's in such a heavy role and a heavy position, that you would just continue by your Holy Spirit to comfort her and to guide her and to protect her family. And so, God, we're thankful for the work of this ministry uh, and our partnership with them, and I just pray that you continue to bless the work of their hands and uh, give us the wisdom and discernment in how we can best support and come alongside. 
So God, we also thank you for this church community and this time to worship you outside. And so God, we also uh, ask you to bless the food that we're about to eat, bless the hands that prepared it, uh, and bless our conversation as we just do life together and engage in conversation. So we love you, Lord, and we lift you up in all these things in your name. Amen. So thanks for being here. Um, we're gonna start eating. The, the, the recipe or the menu is barbecue chicken. Um, so I would spread your chairs out and then anyone who's got the muscle wants to grab a table and